Garlic or Gibbon in a green hooded pullover hid behind a van parked across the street from the entrance to his girlfriend's residence. He watched a long time, occasionally glancing to the left and right, but mainly kept his eyes on the windows of Nancy Burke's apartment. He checked his watch several times, finally stepping out from behind the van after one last look at the time. Not too soon either, it seemed, for a fat man got into the van and drove away, audibly muttering imprecations against hooded apes. Gibbon sneered at the departing van, but continued quickly to the door between the two ground floor businesses in the building. He moved as silently as he could up the stairs and listened breathlessly at Nancy's door. As he did so, <clears throat> he noticed that the door of the adjacent apartment was ajar. His goal had been Nancy's apartment, but as he felt he had a few seconds to spare, he took a look through the crack. He was amazed to see that the apartment next door appeared to be nothing like Nancy's. It was a large open space containing... He put his head through the doorway. Nothing. The ceiling was at least twice as high as the one in the other apartment at the top of the stairs. Gibbon walked inside as he could, as he could clearly see there was no one there. If anyone had caught him, he could plausibly explain that he thought the place was for rent. Not only was there no furniture, but there were no other rooms. Gibbon calculated that, calculated that the place had doubled the square feet of Nancy's apartment. That's funny, he thought. One would think they were exactly the same from the view outside. In fact, they had to be the same. The roof line, the two halves of the building, all were exactly equal. <clears throat> Gibbon turned around and saw that the place wasn't totally empty after all. There was a single hard-backed chair facing the shared wall between the two apartments. He approached it. Directly in front of the chair was a strangely shimmering aperture in the wall. This shimmer ceased, however, once one was seated, as Garlic or Gibbon soon was in the chair and looking into the aperture. A cold spasm shook Gibbon on realizing that he was seeing into his girlfriend's apartment. Who had sat in this same chair before he had? He knew that the aperture was, aperture was invisible from the other side. Not only had he no memory of seeing anything amiss on that wall, but something about the aperture's appearance told him of its uncanny nature. A sound to his right paralyzed him with fear. Someone was coming up the stairs. He stood and moved closer to the wall, preparing to act as innocent as a glass of water should someone come in. The visitor, however, fumbled with her keys and entered the next door apartment. Excitedly, excitedly Gibbon sat back down and watched as the aperture showed him his girlfriend putting her purse on the entry table. She went towards the bedroom. Just as Gibbon wished he could follow her there, the aperture granted him the view he sought. He didn't bother to wonder at what brain interface, interface technology was at work, how the chair was connected to this magic hole in the wall. He only watched. He watched as Nancy not only disrobed, but removed her gorilla costume as well. She stood revealed as a naked human being. While Garlic were given up into the chair, looking for wires, Nancy stepped into jeans, a plum-colored blouse, and a nearly new pair of kids, and slipped out through the hidden door in her closet, a detail that her boyfriend did not witness as he was by then too busy trying to find out how this elaborate trick had been played on him. But Nancy Burke was indeed a human being. As she hurried through the secret corridor that ran below Pine Box Stadium, she reflected that the deception was so good and had been effects for so long now that she had actually begun to think of herself as an ape in many ways. This duality will eventually eat my sanity, she thought, taking out her coded pass card and using it to access her bedroom in Wapshock Falls at the end of the corridor. The question is, Pleat Mathers posited as he concluded his reading, did Toadskabut find any of this out when he spied on Nancy? He laid his big hands on his now-closed notebook and looked across the table at, at Angelica. She in turn looked back at him in confusion. Toadska who? she wondered. I, I must not have read that part. You didn't? Pleat asked. Oh, that part must have been in the previous notebook. He tapped the much-abused cover of his manuscript. Toadska what is the character who had been using the vacant apartment next to Nancy. Next door to Nancy, he explained. When are you going to type up your book, Angelica asked. I am typing it. I type it as I go, but for the writing itself, I feel more comfortable writing it out by hand first. I type up what I've written every day. Plus, that helps me gauge what I've written. I think it was Bukowski who said you don't know if you, what you've written is good, any good or not until you read it back a month later, Angelica said. Well, you'll have to forgive me, but I don't think much of, of Bukowski. Really? I would have thought that he'd be... Her words were cut short, shorter than... That shorter than that, even, for she really wanted to say, I don't have to forgive anybody, by the appearance in the coffee shop of Cooler McCrud. Pleat saw him enter and hunched down. There's somebody here I don't want to see, he interrupted Angelica. 
I'm going to hide in the bathroom. Explain later. He almost crawled away towards the back of the establishment. He sequestered himself in the single occupancy men's room until finally someone pounded on the door. How long are you going to be in there? The voice, not McCrud's, as far as Pleat could determine, demanded. Pleat opened the door and peered over and around the head of the college kid. Sorry, he said without making eye contact. He could not see McCrud anywhere. He went back to his table and found Angelica and his spiral-bound notebook gone. He assumed that Angelica had gotten tired of waiting and left, taking the notebook with her. However, he was, it was not the young woman who now had, not, had possession of that portion of Bleak's manuscript. It was Cooler McCrud. Exiting her parents' home in Wapshock Falls, Nancy Burke was spotted by a photographer, photographer for the local paper. He asked her to pose by one of the antique streetlights that lined Nogrog Street. This photograph, while it never made it into the paper, was one day included in the coffee table book that King Coob came across during the course of his research for the new Americana section of his memorial theme park. Look at her, he is rumored to have exclaimed. She looks like a vision of post-war affluence. He placed his rubbery green fingers on the page intellectually inclined, clean, the first stirrings of unambiguous non-virginity. Hail, Hail Mephiticus, the architect and designer for the King's Project, looked in wonder at his client. <coughs> at his client. Are you interested in her as a template of some kind for the park, he asked, because I thought the idea was more turn of the century. Hell, man, I'd just like to fuck her, that's all, Coop snapped. Oh, Mephiticus, however, was not entirely assured. Really? He broke further. Are you are you sexually attracted to females outside your uh, species? King Coob looked at Mephiticus in horror and rage. He was so taken aback, in fact, that a flush of pink was discernible about his cheekbones. Species? He bellowed. What the hell do you think I am? Who do you think you're talking to? I'm King Coob. I'm a king by my own hand. Mephiticus, who had worked for some demanding clients during his career, was not particularly frightened. However, in order to smooth things over, he feigned a measure of anxiety at, King, at Coob's outburst. He held up his hands and turned his head as Coob continued to roar. I'm a man, a human, just like any other, only more so. He slammed his fist down on the table, causing a stack of reference materials to fall over. I'm sorry if I offended you, your... Majesty, Mephiticus addressed Coob in his much-desired form for the first and only time. I didn't realize. He had remained calm throughout the episode. Coob ran his hand over his enormous nose. He moved the books and papers off the picture of Nancy Burke where they had fallen. How much does this book cost, he asked. That, oh, that's about a hundred dollar book. Coob raised his scaly brow ridges and glanced at Mephiticus. A hundred dollars? Expensive book. But keep it if you want, the architect offered. After all, he could add the book's cost to his bill. No, no, that's all right. Only, Coob lifted the page with Nancy's picture. He turned it over and studied the other side. It was another photo of Wapshock Falls, this one featuring a goat. How would I go about learning more about this girl? And, he quickly added, this town, this uh, Wapshock Falls. That can be arranged. The photographer can be contacted. He will have records for each photograph. King Coop was learning that anything could be arranged. He directed Mephiticus to find out who the girl was. The architect gave the assignment to one of his assistants, who came back a week later with the news that the girl's name was Nancy Burke. Nancy Burke? Mephiticus repeated. Wasn't that the name of the talking gorilla woman in, two -headed, in the two-headed boxer? The assistant snorted. The two-headed boxer can't be trash from the 70s. Sure, the first movie was some sort of a classic, strictly within, it, within its discreet, discreet genre, but the series taken as a whole was garbage. Mephiticus smiled back. You can snicker all you want, but I was deeply impressed as a teenager, teenager by those termite nest-like dwellings in the movie, he sighed. That's the kind of architecture I wanted to do. Not this. He did not complete his sentence, but gestured at the cardboard and glue mock-up of King Coop's American Main Street project. The assistant, a young man whose knowledge of the films did not extend to having actually watched them, searched his mind for any termite mound-like dwellings. He recalled the most famous scenes, familiar from a general knowledge of popular culture, especially the one in which the two-headed boxer argues with his reflection in the mirror, but he couldn't recall any architecture in connection with the series other than that of a small college town. 
Had the young man asked the macaque people, he would have found them doubly informative on the subject. Doubly because they had not only become experts on the series, but also because in their zeal to express their obsession, they had begun construction on a village in the style of the so-called termite mounds. This village was nearly a mile away from the settlement established for them by the university researchers. An old hippopotamus trail connecting, connected the two. Everyday members of the community could be seen walking back and forth, carrying building materials or crude drawings traced from images on the TV screen. When the scientists stopped by for their monthly visit, they were alternately perplexed, amused, and enraged. What are we going to do? One with curly blonde hair asked. Why do we have to do anything, another responded. The team members wore either blue jeans or cargo shorts. Most wore t-shirts with a sponge cookie sampler band logo on them, but one or two mavericks, by inclination, wore shirts with pictures on them of such bands as Nostrum Mate or Pecker's Billfold. One young woman wore a tank top that excitingly gripped her well-developed bosom in the steamy jungle atmosphere. But none of her colleagues attended much to this, or as theirs was a comradely group dedicated to the furtherance of science. Well, it's clear that they're wasting their time, said one of the team, this one a painfully thin young man with hair and a beard like a merino sheep. Why do you say that, someone challenged. Perhaps it was the girl in the tank top. Because they're never going to finish it. They're never going to be able to build this village they've got in mind. Why? Because they're macaques? No, because they're stuck in the jungle with a limited budget. Well, how do you think the apes and the two-headed boxer built their village? Um, I'd like to point out that that was actually built by Hollywood set designers and union craftsmen. Actually, I think the first two-headed boxer fi- Actually, I think the first two-headed boxer film was a joint Canadian-German production filmed in New South Wales. Yeah, but the village they're copying was in the second film. Third. No, I think it was in the second. No, it had to be the third because that's the one with the papaya. People, one of the team, dressed in jeans and the boots of a parting of the Red Sea reenactor, interrupted the discussion. We're getting a little off topic. Are we going to help them or are we, or are we going to try to make them stop? Everyone considered the matter. As they did, a couple of macaque girls passed through their midst, one carrying a thermos, the other a macrame wall hanging in olive green and mustard yellow. Excuse me, Karana, one of the team called up to the latter girl. What are you going to do with that? Karana looked over her shoulder, but continued walking. Put it in the lodge of insoluble dreams, she answered with her big white teeth flashing. The team members looked at each other in stupefaction. Lodge of insoluble dreams? Are they really going as far as that? Have they really gotten as far as that? I mean, do they even have a wall on which to hang that thing? Unknown to them, as they discussed their observations further, they were themselves the subjects of observation. From a camouflaged treetop platform, Rusty McCabbage, Alex Bigetti, and a female member of McCabbage's household named Thalaris watched the university people. They come once a month to check on the Macaquians. McCabbage, now dressed in a different, though still futuristic-looking costume of no specific cultural derivation, and sporting his natural short iron-gray hair, explained to Alec, We have tried to maintain a Star Trek-inspired policy of non-intervention, Thalaris added. She was dressed in an outfit outfit seemingly ordered from the same page of the same catalog as McCabbage's. A bronze pendant about her neck marked her as a fan of the Knob and Kubler Nat Show. How many boxes of cereal had she eaten to get that, Alec wondered. Thalaris means non-intervention in both the lives of the Macaquians and the researchers from the University of McCabbage interjected. Of course, we do interact with the Macaquians. Thalaris was a woman who gestured considerably as, considerably as she spoke. When she said Macaquians, she described an odd figure with her hands that seemed to indicate she was talking about making candy. Can I meet them? Alec was, if possible, even more excited about, the, about discovering the existence of the Macaque people than any of the wonders he had experienced in the last 24 hours. Certainly, McCabbage assured him, but we'll have to wait until after these, ac- these academics have gone. We have impressed upon the Macaqueans that they must not tell their patrons about us. Yeah, Alec nodded in understanding. You know, speaking of which, I really need to get a message to my job and my club, he thought, at the very least telling them that I'm all right. Alec, would you permit us to take care of that? McCabbage placed a hand on Alec's shoulder. We can't risk anyone finding out about us, Solaris insisted. Thalaris, McCabbage said in an, admon- in an admonitory tone. I think we can trust Alec regarding the secret of the cooperative's existence. However, he turned back to Alec. There are those who know that you are among us now. He paused, but n- did not elaborate further. You are among us, aren't you? Even if you are not precisely one of us? Yes, Alec answered. 
I understand the distinction. It's just that I have this club. The job doesn't matter so much, although I don't want my, co want my companions going to unnecessary lengths looking for me. But my club, yes, we know. The Federal Nexor Association. McCabbage proved that he could answer, that he could surprise Alec once again. That's why we selected you, Alec. In answer to Alec's look of confusion, Thalaris took up the ex explanation. You see, Alec, all of the members of the cooperative are devotees of, of more traditional science fiction touchstones. Star Trek, Star Wars, Dune, Umbilical Zucchini. Until very recently, many of our members did not consider the two-headed boxer to be science fiction at all. Alec gasped with the enormity of the oversight. But now, due to a broadening of our outlook, we have decided to extend our rec recreative assimilation to the world of the two-headed boxer. And that's where you come in, McCabbage concluded. You are, as far as we can determine, and within the limits of our search parameters, both the greatest authority on the two-headed boxer phenomenon and its greatest enthusiast. And as much as we appreciate the breadth and depth of the knowledge you have acquired on the subject, a subject, it is your passion for it that we most need. What do you say? Alec glanced back and forth between his interlocutors. To what, exactly? McCabbage exhaled sharply with laughter. <laughs> I'm sorry, he said. I didn't make myself clear. We would like you to join us in the cooperative. We would like you, he again, he again placed his hand on Alec's shoulder, to become our resident expert on the two-headed boxer. You would be in charge of developing that aspect of our reenaction program, as well as helping us assimilate the two-headed boxer into our overall life mission, Dolores added. Alec looked down on the jungle trail along which the macaque people were moving. I'd love to, he sighed, obviously. But I've got a home, a, a job, my, a, my club. I've got commitments to people. I can't just abandon everything to join some secret organization. And that's another thing. He turned to face McCabbage and Thalaris. What if I decided not to join you? How can you be sure I won't betray your secret? McCabbage smiled. As I mentioned earlier... There are others who know you are with us. Our cooperative isn't all that secret. It is, not, it is merely not publicized. However, these others, these are people who stand against what we are trying to do. We would not object to your telling the world of our existence, but who would believe you? Or even care? Those most interested are those dedicated to stopping us. Would you help them, having seen all that you have? No, Alec insisted. No, of course not. He looked angrily at his feet. Alec, as far as your job is concerned, we believe that the Space Limited Accomplishments is responsible for some of the setbacks we've suffered over the past year. Therefore, technically, you're already working for one of our enemies. Quitting would be a good thing. And as to your home, you could sell it. The money you made on the sale would be converted to cooperative credits and used to construct your own futuristic dwelling in the valley. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Alec had to smile. Maybe some of the more passionate members of my... I'm sorry... Maybe some of the more passionate members of my club could join me. Maybe. He looked at McCabbage, but it was Thalaris who answered him. Alec, there's something you need to know about the Federal Nexor Association. It's been Ill infiltrated by agents for Turlebog Machine of Bertota. What? That, uh, that new member, the one that attended your last meeting, the one with the genuine Gallagher Gibbon costume, he works for TMB. Alec gasped. He instinctively disliked the man, but... Wait a minute, what's TMB? Turlebog Machine of Bertota. They're our main adversaries. They're a manufacturing concern turned philosophy distributor. They hate Toadskabot and are sworn to destroy him, McCabbage said this. He sounded much more like Riker than Picard. But but wouldn't that be a good thing? I mean, if Toadskabot is the head of the Space Limited Accomplishments, and Space Limited Accomplishments is... Dolores interrupted Alex's nervous objection. The hour grows late, she told McCabbage. If we're going to visit the Macaquians, we'd better make arrangements. Yes, agreed McCabbage, glancing at the holographic time display hovering above his opened palm. If you want to meet the Macaquians, we must begin the preparations. Alex shook off his reservations and his looming choice. He nodded. Sure, he said. He then followed McCabbage and Thalaris down the tube of balanced air to the ground. Here they hurried into the hidden tunnel that had led them to this part of the jungle. Ten minutes later, Alec found himself in a room being fitted out in, dis in a disguise of unparalleled cunning. What exactly are we supposed to be, he asked his host. Giant squirrels, explained McCabbage, who, like Alec and Thalaris, was wearing a close-fitting squirrel costume. Who are we trying to fool, the Macaquians or the university scientists, Alec asked. Well, as I told you earlier, McCabbage allowed an assistant to darken the hollows around his eyes with a dark grease. We are trying to keep our interactions with the Macaquians a secret from the scientists. However, should they come across us, or should one of the Macaquians slip up and tell them of us, these disguises as ordinary giant squirrels will give us a measure of protection. 
ordinary giant squirrels. Alex must, it must express his dubiety. I've never heard of such a thing. Well, true, the squirrel people, McCabbage began. However, Alec cut him short. Squirrel people? Yes, Alec, are you unfamiliar with them? McCabbage looked bemused. They were featured in an article of, March 19, of the March 1999 issue of Cordial Flounderman's Grout. Thalara Th sounded as if she was discussing the ongoing disgruntlement of the moon colonist. That is a common topic in the news. I'm sorry, but I've never heard of Cordial Flanderman's Grout or any giant squirrel people. Alec held up his hands, keeping one of the other cooperative members in the room from fitting a squirrel mask over his head. Do you want to visit the Macaquians or not? Dolores demanded, betraying an undecidedly, displaying a decidedly unutopian peak. Among the gifts that the macaque people pressed into Alec's hands at the conclusion of his afternoon, afternoon with them was a dog-eared paperback copy of the novelization of the film Microcephalic Bear. Alec had never heard of it. That night, as he lay in the guest quarters provided for him by McCabbage, he found to sleep impossible. He turned to the book to distract his mind from thoughts of racing through it like chickens were scattering before the tractor. Opening the title page, he read Microcephalic Bear, a novelization of the film by Buddy Groins. Looking at the copyright information, Alec discovered that the film was, itself was based on a novel by someone named Bell Nihili. This immediately made him think even less of the book, but intrigued by the potential awfulness of it, he turned to the first page of text and began to read. Granny's hangout had spongy brown furniture and a dead eel on top of the fridge. The humanoid puppet that stood before the electric oven drank his coffee and the light from the oven's exhaust hood. Only this sound was the, the only sound was the occasional sipping noise. Across town, Mr. Maloof directed the unloading of a crate from the back of the truck. Easy, goddammit. The pot-bellied Mr. B Maloof, dressed in chinos, a thin tan shirt, and a tropical overseer's hat, barked at the gang of men lowering the massive crate to the ground. What's in this damn thing? One of the men demanded irritably. The crate obviously weighed a good deal. Never you mind about that, Mr. Maloof ordered, now that the crate stood safely on the black soil of the lot behind the abandoned cricket farm. Let's just get this thing inside. He ordered the men to throw ropes around the crate and drag it through the open door of the long cinder block building. Why couldn't you have gotten a forklift? The same man as before complained. You're getting paid, aren't you? Now pull. Back at Granny's hangout, the puppet, whose spiky hair was turquoise and whose skin was cantaloupe orange, the latter consist contrasting with his egg-shaped magenta nose, moved from the kitchen into the living room, where a large apparatus of bizarre design awaited him. The machine, standing on a short platform of black laminate, was composed almost entirely of transparent black tubes and chrome connectors. The pu puppet positioned himself before a mouthpiece on one side of the apparatus. He took a theatr the theatrically deep breath and blew into the mouthpiece. His thin, floppy arms flew Bailed about as he emptied his possibly non-existent lungs. Only as he neared the end of his capacity to exhale did an impossibly low bovine no note emanate from the toilet plunger-like outlet on the uppermost part of the machine. The puppet fell back, gasping and choking, yet gratified clearly, for he gazed up at the top of the collection of tubes and whirligigs with a look of rapture. The basso profundo note he had managed to produce still echoed faintly in the room, moving through the thread there, bare walls of the ancient gray trailer and out into the night air. It has been said that elephants communicate through tones too low for the human ear to detect, and although science has been thoroughly discredited time and again, it may yet be true, for this note of the puppets traversed the darkened black roads of the little country town to reach the old cricket farm. There it was received by something inside Mr. Maloof's crate, just as the door of the old cinder block building was shut upon it. A plaintive moan came from within the crate in response, causing the men standing, standing sweating outside to look up in stark terror. What was that? one of them asked. It's a shame you boys had to hear that, said Mr. Maloof. A weapon, alien in appearance next to the guns of this planet, appeared suddenly in his hand. With a cackle of sadistic pleasure, he cut his hired help down. The men fell to the black soil in a heap of smoldering bodies. Mr. Maloof took off his hat and waved it over his head, signaling to some unseen ally in the woods on the other side of the lot. Putting his hat back on his head, he turned and padlocked the door. He was joined almost immediately by a woman bearing roughly his same number of years, dressed in a moth-eaten old plaid jacket, black sweatpants, and gray nylon track shoes. Her hands were sheltered in the pockets of her jacket against a chill night or air. How are we going to get rid of them, she asked her husband, for that is what Mr. Maloof was to her. 
We're going to feed them to the bear, Mr. Maloof replied. He sounded pleased with himself. Then why did you shoot them out, out here, Mrs. Maloof wondered. The middle-aged man's mouth gaped, strings of saliva lending his face the appearance of a gel gelatin jack-o'-lantern. Back at Granny's hangout, the puppet, exhausted by his efforts, was enjoying a chocolate sandwich and reading a sock as a magazine. The articles were contained in the smashes of squares of mesh, while the pictures could be viewed by holding the sock up to the light. The text on one side of the sock would combine with the text on the other side, creating the picture. The trouble is, he explained to Alex, who had come to wait for his friends to arrive, that if you don't hold the sock correctly, the text mesh square will line up with the wrong one, and you get a false illustration of what the article is about. He gave us an example of what he was talking about, a 16th century woodcut of, woodcut of a group of naked primitives gigging frogs in a cold-looking swamp. As you can see, the boat they're in is a modern, modern speedboat, complained the puppet, whereas clearly in the article the boat in question is a large potato wedge. Alec tried to make out what he was talking about, but told the puppet, I don't see how you can read that. The print is so small. Oh, it's easy. I've got tiny eyes. Here, put me on your hand, and you'd give it a try. Alec did so, lifting the puppet up and inserting his arm into its sock-like opening. He then began reading the puppet itself, finding the tiny holes in its foam head to contain individual words, which read in the exact sequence in which he read them, spelled out an emotionally wrenching poem. Pram King kept his narco plants in the Zola douche, he said aloud, deeply moved. There was more to the poem, of course, but Alec kept this opening line alive in his memory by repeating it over and over. He was still saying it to himself as he answered the door. It's the friends, he thought happily, looking out at the crowd. Listen to this, he told them. I've got to tell you this before I forget it. Pram King kept his narco plants in the Zola douche. Premium tenders of yolk. Isn't that beautiful? It's great, I answered, with just the right hint of sarcasm. I took a seat on the cheap, poorly made, but all the more cozy and evocative for being so, sofa. Jerry introduced Mr. and Mrs. Maloof to everyone and explained that they had brought a guest. He's really a gorilla, Mrs. Loof, uh, Mrs. Maloof at, laughed, a little embarrassed at being the center of attention. Mr. Maloof was obviously, clearly, legibly thinking, microcephalic bear, microcephalic bear. It's a microcephalic bear, you stupid bitch. Clarksville said, a microcephalic gorilla would be a regular bear. Exactly, agreed Alec. But would a microcephalic bear necessarily be a gorilla? I asked humorously. Jerry smiled and raised his shoulder, knowing that an answer wasn't needed. Say, I continued, do you remember my first book? The first book you wrote? Yeah. Well, I never read it, but I remember you saying, well, I've finally written a book. Yeah, I was so relieved. It was called Garland of Snot. Garland of Snot, Jerry repeated. Yeah, what's wrong with that? Nothing. Excuse me, Mrs. Maloof, momentarily rising into corpor corporeality once again, interrupted. Your book was called Garland of Snot? Yes, it was. Now you just lie back and close your eyes. I turned to Jerry. I wonder if Alec will remember his dreams. I don't know. But go on with your reminiscence, Jerry urged. Oh, that was it. That was it? You're not going to recount the plot? Oh, it was just some random crap. Just something to fill up the requisite number of pages. Jerry smiled. Well, shall we leave Alec to sleep in peace, he asked. I guess so. I agreed, though I was loath to quit the cozy living room. As we stepped down into the tunnel below the cheap little sofa, as we stepped down into the tunnel below the cheap little sofa, I asked Jerry if he wouldn't mind doing me a favor. Would you go back to Wapshot Falls and retrieve our balloon? I was just going to suggest that myself, Jerry thought. I realize I'm just an imaginary person, but I enjoy some measure of autonomy, he continued to himself as we had par after we had parted company at a juncture in the tunnels. Like this, little, like this little errand, for instance. I'm going off on my own. It shows everybody, not least of, not least of whom myself, that I'm independent of Toad's Cabot. Still, I need to keep, come up with something to, that I do on my own, something that I stand for, something that is my raison d'etre. I can't just be Toad's Cabot's sidekick. What kind of identity is that? What I need, he gropingly decided as he neared the Wapshock Falls exit, is an imaginary friend of my own. Yes, he thought with rising triumph at his inspiration. That's not a bad idea. But how does one go about getting an imaginary friend? Jerry held out his hand as if offering an invisible, an invisible companion the chance to precede him through the door leading to Wapshock Falls. As he did so, he was struck by the idea of, a, of talking to a puppet on his hand. Mike has a puppet with him, he thought. I wonder if I could use it. He stepped into the room at the end, filled with expectation and optimism.